Good afternoon. Uh, I'm trying to follow the captain's orders. Please <laughs> sit down and try and find a seat. My name is Kamazima Luiza. For those who don't know me, I'm the director of undergraduate programs here at SOMAS. And uh, I want to introduce my boss, the associate dean for undergraduate education in SOMAS, and the, the director of uh, sustainability studies program, Dr. Heidi Hartner. She she graduated from a little school, I like these little school, University of Washington, you never heard of it? <laughs> uh, she graduated, she got a PhD from UW in 1993 and they came to Stonebrook in 1995. And I uh, first met Heidi like eight years ago when she was involved with the, in the environmental club. She was trying to teach them about feminism, I thought. But in fact, she was trying to make them appreciate the contribution of women into environmental issues. And so without further ado, I want to let Heidi take it away and talk to you about environmental communication. Thank you. So I'm just checking the sound. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. So I'll tell you a little bit more about myself and why Larry asked me to talk today. I am a writer. Uh, I'm not a poet like David, but I'm a writer. I write narrative nonfiction, and I also write um, for, for news and for magazines and for, for the general public. I also keep a blog, and less so lately because I'm pretty busy, but I, I used to keep a blog regularly on environmental issues. And I also am very involved with media. I have my own webisode, which means I go into the studio, I invite the guests, it was my concept. I do it. It's on campus. And I've had the great fortune to speak to amazing people in the field, scientists, artists, activists, uh, writers, musicians. Carl Safin has been on my show. Some of the things on my show have actually been incorporated into articles I've written. So two of my pieces, um, two articles I've written, and, and two interviews I've done uh, are, were in the New York Times. And the, and, the, and the interviews were embedded in my Articles, and that's something new, right? This is we're in a brave new world of news, where we do have the fake news problem. But I'm going to speak to some of the, the exciting parts of it, which are you can be incredibly creative and inventive in how you impart information to the general public now, and we also can do it in really new and exciting ways. I'm going to start by talking about this photograph. So this is um, a photograph taken by a friend of mine who's a, a physician on the Navajo Nation in, um, in Arizona. And he is an African-American doctor who has seen a lot of illness around mining issues and pollution issues on the reservation. Um, this woman, her name is Steph. She's actually the sweetest, most vivacious, bubbly person. She looks so dark here, but, um, and kind of dark in the sense of mood. Uh, but so you can see what they've done. They have on her face painted the words, I am changed, but also industrialization, drought, um, water, air, snow, CO2, pollution, um, all across her face. And what Chip does is he, ha he does this art form called wheat pasting. And this is a photograph he took of her face. And then he puts it up either on, on walls in public spaces, almost like you know big, big, big spaces. For instance, this, this was in Brooklyn in one space, but also on the reservation on large water towers, on old, old decaying buildings. And it's definitely public messaging about what's happening to the people on his reservation and what's happening to our earth. Um, and I just wanted to start with that because that's a, that's a very interesting. So he, here, he's a physician, right? He could, he could communicate this the illness issues and the health problems in a, in a paper or in a public talk in a much more scientific, medical, traditional way. But this is what he's choosing to do in terms of expressing this issue. So the frame that I'm going to talk about, a set of frames, which there's an article, interesting article I found called Communicating Climate Change. And it's a conglomeration of looking at all these studies about how, how people are communicating cli climate change and when, it, when it's successful, how they're doing it. So first you have to figure out um, what's your framework. And that sounds easy, but you don't want to just get up and talk about climate change in a totally general way. You have, a, you have an approach or a thing that you're addressing. So it could be, going back to the photograph, environmental justice. Or it could be you want to talk about the economics, and you might have a particular approach with the economics. So we all have a framework. We, we should, when we get up and we talk about an issue, or when we create some kind of media form that we're, we're advocating for something or articulating some message with. 
Um, and then there's an approach. So you're not just saying, oh, climate change is terrible. You have a solution of some kind in mind, and that has to be articulated. And the more refined that is, the better. Because if it's too broad and too general, the public just kind of goes, OK, and then they walk out the room. But the more specific you are and the clearer you are about that, the better the message will be. And then you have to determine, and we've been talking about this all day, who's your audience? So obviously, you know, you all as scientists are going to respond to a particular kind of message. A humanities audience is going to respond differently. A totally lay audience, and we'll be getting, getting to this later, a Christian audience, because we'll be talking about a, a, a climate scientist who calls herself a, Christian, a cr Christian climate scientist. So depending on your audience, that's going to be, you have to think about that. And what are you calling on that audience to do? The more you know that, the better. You leave them feeling this sort of vague sense of, uh, OK, you, that's not good messaging, right? So you, the, other, the other key piece, and Christine sort of addressed this, is you want to be, um, you want to be communicating. And part of that is being relatable. So if I come to you and you don't know anything, you don't feel from comfortable with me, you don't feel I'm a familiar kind of person, then it's kind of alienating. So when you go to the general public and you want to be speaking to them in both the language, as Christine suggested, that they understand, but also your demeanor. So the more personal you are, the more you can relate to them and who they are, the better in terms of messaging. Also, you want to, and I think this is actually really interesting because I've been going to a lot of um, groups on Long Island and working with them on various environmental issues and looking at how they talk about it and what they want to get involved with. You want to address problems and issues that affect your audience. And I think that's actually a problem with some of the climate change messaging. It's too big. But if you talk about it specifically in a community and they can relate to it and they see how it affects them right here, right now, in their homes, in their community, in their schools, they're more likely to want to get involved. That's what they care about, and that's what they can, that, that's what they can relate to. So that's the be local. So there's some groups I've been, I've been working with and sort of floating around looking at what they're doing. They keep wanting to do, on Long Island, all the groups I've, I've, local, I've, I've seen directly, they keep wanting to work with water. They've heard about the L4 dioxane, they're really worried, and they want to know what they can do. And that's incredibly local, right? That's their kids, their water, their drinking water. And they're getting active with it, actually. The other piece is style of communication. So obviously, there's many different ways to communicate. You know, there's, there's the comic, apocalyptic, personal, artistic, which is obviously very varied, and scientific factual, which you all are more familiar with. One of the things the, the, these studies show is that apocalyptic is not so effective, because it makes people feel like, why bother? We're done. It's over. So you want to be very careful with your messaging. You don't want people to feel it's hopeless and there's nothing to be accomplished. But you also don't want to leave them thinking it's just all funny and there's, you know, you have, it's somewhere in the middle, right? You have to find that, that sweet spot of telling them like it is, but also giving them a sense that something could be done and we really can fix this. So, and there's many different forms that we often, we often think, especially in this audience, we often think, you know, it has to come from some kind of public talk or a news article that's pretty factual. But in fact, as we're going to see today, there's many, many different ways of imparting information, inspiring people, and educating people. Um, one is film and video. So I just, I, you know, what is this? Does this look familiar to anyone, this, this picture? Would you guess a popular film? This is Avatar, right? So one of the biggest selling films in, in all time. And, and so that means masses of people have seen this. And it has a very strong environmental message. Whether you think it's effective or not, it's had a big impact. It has a large audience. So maybe he could have done it better, maybe not, but it's a powerful medium. Um, TV, obviously, lots of TV. We can do much with that. Music, which I'll be talking about toward the end, surprisingly can have a very large impact. Um, art, many forms of that. We'll look at that as well. And theater and dance. So um, some of you know that you can get the little message that I've been associate producing this musical. And what's really, what was really impressive to me was that uh, I brought Pat Wright, um, the primatologist, to see it. I was very nervous that she would think the animals weren't cutting it. They weren't really, their animal behavior was bad, you know. But she actually said it was really exciting and she loved what the actors were doing. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So theater can have a huge impact too. And we've had large audiences of children coming. And the idea is to educate them and to make them feel empowered to make change and to get involved. Um, uh, news, we all know news, and then narrative nonfiction, fiction, poetry, and drama. We've heard a lot about poetry, I'm not going to touch that, but I want to talk a little bit about narrative nonfiction today, and if you look at those two works, I would call them both 
some kind of narrative nonfiction, right? They're, we've evolved since that time, but they are. And think about their impact. It's huge. It's huge. It is, you know, these two books have made tremendous changes. Found spring in terms of policy, and but also relatability. Many people read it, and they you feel really touched by the connection to nature, and then very, very upset by what we've done to nature, right? The whole pollution question in DDT, which we have a history here with DDT, but it started with Silent Spring, really, in terms of effectively changing our understanding of, of toxicant. And Walden, Walden is the book that sort of makes people want to go into nature, right? It's the whole, and there's a trace of this literature. Bill McKibben writes about it. If any of you know who he is, he's a major force behind climate activism. He's one of the primary founders of 350.org. And his book, The End of Nature, um, talks about, ta is directly Refer, uh, referring to Walden, as are many, many pieces of literature, and it's influencing. It's a heavy-duty influence of, of our culture and our understanding of nature, care of nature, and so on. And then public talks, and fiction as well. There's lots of fiction we could think of um, we, that has had an impact on our understanding of the environmental world. Long, long list of things, and waking people up. And public talks. So right now we know the TED Talk series. Er, we have TEDx's here. Those are pretty influential. People are listening to them. They're popular. They can get millions of views. You can get a message out in 10 to 15 minutes and say a lot. And all of you should think about doing it, really, because it's available on our campus and you get trained. All that Christine was doing when I, in this, in this session, um, I, when I did a TEDx and uh, I was amazed at what their team did for me. I thought, oh, I don't need any help. I went in with a paper that was pretty academic and read it to this fellow who was offered to help me from the theater department who works with the Allen Alda Center. And he just, he, he, he was very quietly said, put your paper down. Let's have him take a seat. What's, and we just started having this conversation. I didn't even know he was working with me already. And then he said, would you mind just stand up and just tell me again? Uh, and then he kept asking me more questions and I answered him. And he said, okay, I think we're done today. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're done. And I, and I thought, oh my God, I just wrote the talk standing up in a very casual way, answering his questions. And I thought, I'm going to forget it. How will I know? I went home and I typed it out. I never forgot it. I went back and kept working with him. And he really, he helped me with some of the, I talk a little too fast. And he slowed me down. And he told me when to take a breath. But other than that, that first conversation, I put the paper away. I had the whole long academic thing written out, gone, never use it again. So. Public talks can be very effective, and the tr you've got amazing training right here. You've got the, I mean, Allen Alden Center is, you know, internationally recognized now. So I really highly recommend using it if that's something you want to do. And you may not want to. It's not for everyone, right? Not everyone wants to go be a public speaker. But if you have any interest or inclination, it's a great thing to try. So the other thing that's very interesting, and this goes back to kind of what, some of what um, Howie was talking about. So the negative is anybody can say anything now. Right? You can put a blog up, costs you nothing. Go to Blogspot, put your name in, put your email address, and you can just start talking. You can say whatever you want. And if you're clever enough, you can put hashtags in, and you will get lots and lots of hits. And it's really kind of fun. You go and check, wow, got this many hits today. So, but the, but the positive side is anybody can speak. Anybody can have a message and create and do it in a very inventive way. And you can have an impact, and you can also you can, tra you can translate what you're doing and reach masses of people. And you don't have to, and it's very exciting sometimes. Yes, it's great to get your article in the New York Times. It's not so easy to get your article in the New York Times. Sound it's easier said than done. It's not so easy to get into Atlantic Magazine. You can, you can. People do all the time. But here, you have access to message as much as you like, whenever you like, and really get information out quickly. And it can be exciting. You might be at that mountain when that volcano erupts. You can put it on your iPhone, and you can go Facebook Live, and people can watch it. The crew that has to fly there from wherever could take them a day or hours or whatever. So you have immediate access to, to, access, to, to communicating information. Uh, and we've seen that in some cases, in some political cases with race issues lately, it's helpful, right? That camera can give evidence on things that we, we, need, more, we need more access to. So there's a kind of dem 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 democratizing of information here that I think is extremely positive. And for your information, all environmental communicators are doing this. So I have, I, you know, some people say, oh, my daughter used to say, say to me, you're on Facebook too much. I said, I have to be. That's where Andy Revkin is. 
You can go on and you can watch Andy Revkin post and talk publicly all the time. That he's the, one of the leading environmental journalists in the world. They're all on Twitter. They're all on Facebook. Instagram is more photographs, so if you'd like to take pictures, it's a great place to go. I'm not so much into Instagram. Um, but they are important. And as I mentioned before, I created my own video show. You don't need, and it's great that we have a TV studio here, and Dini's fantastic, and I, you know, it's a wonderful facility. However, you don't even need that anymore. You could just stand up with your camera and just start talking. And, it, you, and this is a room full of people with really important information. And done in the right way, you can reach a lot. So it's a very, it's a, I think it's an exciting time. The key is you need to know who, who the person is blogging. Um, so, I mean, Andy Brebkin blogs. I mean, that, that dot earth, which he is no longer doing now, he's at ProPublica, that was called a blog. So it's not always just my personal story and I'm telling you about my kids today. Some people do that and they take pictures of their vacation. It could be very high level work. You have to know what that is. So we do want to avoid fake news. You do want to do research. You do want to teach your students to do that. I use blogging in my class. Um, what it does, and we do, you know, I usually work with a, a TA to edit and make sure the writing is strong. It forces my students to treat their writing a little more seriously because they know it's public. So it, in that sense, it's very, it's very useful. And these are all skills that, you know, in my class we work on, video making, um, blogging. We do use Facebook some. And the reason I like Facebook, the other reason, is it's a way to communicate um, what I'm teaching to, to more people. That's why I have a, my own personal website, because I got tired of going to parties and having people say, What's, what book should I read? What film should I watch? What should I be doing? And I have everything that I work with my students on, actually. Um, lots of information so the layperson can go there and find out general information about environmental issues, books to read, films to watch, and that sort of thing. So I, I think it's a, it's a really interesting time for that. And it is your own voice. And within that, you use those techniques I talked about, choosing your message. That's the other piece, which is um, there's a whole branding aspect here. If this is something you want to do, you start defining who you are to the general public. They know to go to you for particular kinds of information. And they start to identify you as a type of brand. I know that sounds kind of crass, but that's how we are today. That's how social media works. We, ha we identify with something, and then we keep going back there as a source. Um, so there's lots of environmental films. I'm not going to go into each of these that have had tremendous influence. We know Avatar. The Cove I want to talk about separately for a minute, but Everything's Cool is a really interesting one. Um, Heidi Cullen was in that. We brought Heidi Cullen here, I believe. Malcolm, you brought Heidi Cullen here? Just talk a few years ago. Yeah, she's, she, now, she's a prime example of taking being a scientist and really becoming a very effective communicator. And I recommend you looking her up if you haven't seen her speak. And the film is very, it's actually quite clever. They show her evolution from her first time on TV <coughs> to becoming more, more comfortable with it. And in the beginning, she's, you know, she's kind of a, I don't know what the word is to say, but she's, she's not very well dressed. Her hair's kind of a mess. She, 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 she speaks, she uses too many words. And they tell her, you know, you have to dumb down your vocabulary, um, use, you know, don't use multisyllabic words. Uh, and she starts to see her, it's, it's kind of funny that bringing in makeup, doing her hair, so that she's somebody that the public identifies as a TV head, but they can also trust her in a way. They're more familiar with that. They're not familiar with scientists in the lab. And, they, and then she becomes an incredible, and today she's an incredible climate, propon you know, climate abatement proponent. Right? She's working really hard. She's at um, Princeton, and she has a whole network that's based on communicating climate you know, in a very media savvy way. And when she speaks now, she's completely slick and excellent and you know, totally the opposite of who you see in this film. She was, and, well, she was a PhD meteorologist and then was the news announcer on the Weather Channel. Right. Now she's at Climate Central at Princeton. At Princeton, right. right. It's not right. the university, but it's in Princeton. It's, a, it's, it's located in Princeton. So, and she's an extraordinary, extraordinary public speaker now. She's just really, really effective at what she does. And when she was here, I spoke to her about that as being um, a very interesting evolution in terms of feminism. So for, in order for her to be accepted by the general public, she did have to get the hairdo and put the makeup on and change her clothes. And she laughed. She said, it's true. It's true. I did have to do that. And that sort of put her into a certain path. Um, there's many others here that have had an influence. I, I didn't list Gasland because I know that um, Jeff Levinson doesn't like the science in it. But interestingly, because um, so we've had many conversations about it, 
it did have a big public influence. It did push forward the fracking movement in New York. For good or for ill, it had a very, very powerful impact. Um, and his films are not all accurate. They're not all factually accurate, but they do wake people up. They do get a lot of airtime. They raise questions about climate and about fossil fuels and imp important messages, I think, whether they're perfectly accurate or not. Um, so I want to talk about The Cove for a minute, which I think is a really, how many of you have watched The Cove or seen The Cove? So not, well, you, of course, one of my students has seen The Cove, and Sharon, I'm glad you've seen The Cove. So The Cove, this is where I found it to be very interesting. So The Cove starts out in the very beginning with Rick O'Berry, who was the original trainer of the first five dolphins on The Flipper Show. How many of you watched Flipper? I love Flipper, right? Flipper was my favorite show as a kid, and then I wanted to, of course, the, the marine part, then I thought I would do something with marine, but didn't end up doing it, all because of the bottlenose dolphin, which I know many of you know, many students end up. But what he talks about is really the negative impact of media, because that show spawned a huge, huge exploitation of the bottlenose dolphin. And he has this awakening where one of them, uh, one of those five, dies in his arms. And he tells you at the beginning of the film that he's convinced, she's looking in his eyes, that she's giving him a message. You did this. You created this horrible industry where bottles, bottlenose dolphins are fetishized and exploited. And it's, hor you know, it's horrible. And so then he goes on this mission to change it. And that's what the cove is about, is, ex is showing you the bloody cove. I saved you, I spared you the image of just blood red cove where the dolphins are brought in and the ones that aren't beautiful are slaughtered. They're separated from, it's just, it's a horrible enactment and you can see it. So what's interesting here, he moves from using media in one way, right? Flipper, I'm sure, made him a lot of money, a lot of other people money and spawned a huge multi-million dollar industry of sequariums and aquariums and the dolphin industry. And he has this realization, he says, it has to stop and I need to educate. But how does he educate? A film. And he's on Twitter all the time. And you can watch. It's fascinating, because then I started following this. On Twitter, you can watch the roundup of the dolphins. And you can be active. You can be saying, no, Japan, you're doing a bad thing. And you can hashtag all the things you're supposed to say. But you can literally watch the roundup of the dolphins on Twitter while it's happening and on Facebook. And people gang up on the Japanese government and on these fishermen on social media to try and make change. So there's the two-sidedness there of media, right? The good and the bad. Um, where it can be used as a positive thing, but it's also, he shows you how scary it is when you're commodifying nature. And there's lots of that in media. Lots of it. If you think about zoos and, you know, the way we treat animals in this culture and the danger, I know Pat's here, and the danger with the, with, with the lemur is you turn it into a pet. And then what comes from that is a whole evolution of, of problems through that animal and for habitats. So it's a very fine line how we use social media and how we message. Okay, this is really, I find this to be fascinating. I don't know how many of you know or heard of Bernie Krause. So Bernie Krause is an amazing guy. Actually, I knew him when I was a little girl, so that's a crazy thing. You know how you know people and then they turn out to be amazing people and you don't realize that when you're a kid. So he was a really good family friend. And Bernie Krause started, he started working, he was a musician, he was actually with um, whatever that group is with Pete Seeger in the 60s with they trap. Weavers? He was in the Weavers. He was the youngest member and the last member to join the Weavers. And then he went into the, into the commercial business. He made coffee jingles and the cup of cup of coffee. He wrote that, like crazy stuff, right? So he was in the commercial world. But then he started to work with whales, and he started to work with whale sounds and recording them. And then he became concerned about what's happening to our environment. And he went around all around the world recording nature sounds, animals, wolves, forests, oceans. and. Um, Initially, it was just this great, he created this incredible library, which he wanted to bring to Stony Brook, but wants a lot of money for it. I don't think that's happening. I, try, I proposed it to the past provost. He didn't really respond. But he's got this amazing, amazing library of, of sound. Toward the end of his work now, he's getting older. What he sa he's now talking about and writing about is that you can't hear those sounds anymore. They're going. That the forest you know, are depleted, are, are, are being destroyed, that all of these areas are being destroyed, and you don't hear them. He even complained early on to me how hard it was to record because you always heard something mechanical, a plane, a car, a sound, even in the most remote areas. It was becoming increasingly difficult to record nature sounds. 
But his big thing now is it's going. And so you don't, it doesn't, that, for, that same forest when he goes back there, it does not sound the same. So that's really, but that is a very important message. So those sounds are really, can tell us a lot. Um, and then Ben Mirren, who's actually a fellow in, um, with Carl Safina and his, I don't know what to call his entity, but he's a fellow, he's a fellow. And what he does is, he said Bernie, uh, Bernie Krauss is, his, is really his, sort of his mentor and inspiration. He's taking beatboxing and using animal sounds with the beatboxing. And I interviewed him on my show. I highly, not to sell my show, but the interview was incredible. I learned a lot. He said he's doing these sounds, and he says, I like to use local sounds, sounds like just simple, like the birds that are in you know, Brooklyn, some, some species that is commonly heard in Brooklyn or commonly heard in a particular neighborhood, and then have children hear those sounds so that they come to realize we do have nature where we are and to appreciate it, even, even if it's in a city setting. And so it's really interesting because I thought, oh, you know, sure, yeah, okay. So you, you know, and the beatboxing's cute. And I thought it was a nice idea. Then I took a walk in my neighborhood, and all of a sudden, and I'm not very, you know, nature savvy. I'm the person David's complaining about. I don't know enough about all those different species. So I'm walking around, and I said, oh, I hear that bird, and I started to recognize, you know, that's one of the birds in one of his songs. And I, I never heard nature in that way before. So it can be very powerful especially for people who don't have that experience, who do not necessarily feel a connection to, to animals, to a species, to nature. He's taking it and making it much more in your ear. You're actually hearing it. And now I want to go find out more about that bird. So it's kind of exciting. Um, OK, visual art. So this is interesting. You, I mean, this is obvious here. Let us pause for a moment of climate science, right? Science instead of silence. That can be very, very impactful. One picture can say so much, right? And we all know the images of, of the, you know, the polar bear and how, tra you know, that's one tragic image. But these are all, I mean, this is, this is Banksy, who is a street artist. That's a very pow powerful image. And in, in a, all of the activism going on right now, art, artivism, they're calling, is part of it. Um, just in the same way in the 1960s with a lot of the activism, there was a lot of music. And there is now, too, but I think more than music currently, it's using these images. Um, at a lot of protests, they have puppetry and theater and performance. There's actually a funded artist. Um, I don't know if you know who Rebecca Solnit is, but she's a really important environmental writer and, uh, and otherwise. A pub she's a public, um, public speaker, author, person who advocates for very many political issues, but in particular the environment. Um, her brother is, she works for 350.org, and when there's a huge protest, like at the, the Paris talks, they had a separate entity of people there who were basically activists and advocates outside of the main area of the meetings. Um, and they were all doing their own thing, and a lot of it was art. And they planned for two months before the Paris climate talks a huge art event that would take place when they marched. And he was part of that. They had big studios, and people came. So there's this kind of participation Maybe you won't participate as a journalist. Maybe you won't participate as a scientist. But people can find ways of participating through art, which brings in a whole other set of people, and then can communicate to a whole other set of people. Um, so now this, what's that picture lower right? This one here? Yeah. It's a little fuzzy. I'm sorry about that, but this is really interesting. This is Mary Mattingly. Ha have any of you heard of the swale in New York City? OK, I'm going to start with this, because this is her work. What Mary Mattingly did is she, she wanted to understand waste. So Larry, I don't know if you're here. She took, they, she and her partner took, moved into a space, a small space with all of their belongings, and they cataloged each single thing. And they, they traced where these things were made, what they were made of, the impact on those communities, if you know, had, the materials had been ex excavate, excavated from mining, um, maybe that material led to a war. So, and she put, cataloged all of this in her computer and made it accessible uh, in websites to the general public. Then all of her items, they made, they put them together in these balls with string around them, and they created art pieces. So that's one of, you know, it's either she or her partner with one of their balls of stuff on top of them. They also dragged it around the city streets um, as a, just to show that sort of relationship and videoed it. And so it's a different way of looking at our waste and relating to it, but also having people visualize because we don't realize how much waste we're producing and we have in our homes and that we're using. And to make it really physical and visual. Um, and people could go look it up and say, what, what does that computer have in it? Right? Um, where does that materials come, what, where do those materials come from? Where were they mined from? Um, 
So this is her most recent project, and you can go see it. It's called The Swale, the floating barge. And Jim, I think you would really be interested in this. This floating barge is growing food. It is a farm that is, anyone can go on there and take as much food as they want. It is available to the general public. And it's basically a return to the commons. And the New York City parks, for the first time in 100 years, are allowing people to go onto this space and take, take food, take plants because it's illegal to do so in New York City parks. And her concept here is to go back to the commons, to go back to food sharing, to go back to the space of people coming together and communing together. And it's, it's a very big shared project full of education. And she'd like, obviously, to expand this. Um, and it's also working with the water and the rivers. And she uses some of the river water. They clean it and use it for drinking and for taking care of the plants. We, we talked about this. I think it's an interesting concept that would be great to bring her out here because of the water relationship and, 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 and the food. Um, this top image is the same author, uh, photographer, Chip Thomas, as the first one. And it's, again, fuzzy. And I'm sorry about the quality. But this is a Native American baby, and that's a piece of coal. So if you could see this more clearly, and this was used by 350.org in some of their climate change campaigns. And the idea is, you know, obviously the oppression of the people by coal. But he's, he's playing with, with space and weight. I mean, he, it's not, you know, he did this in a, in a computer. It's simulated. But he's, try, he's playing with this idea of being oppressed by coal and who's most harmed? Babies, right? And Native Americans, because so much mining has gone on their lands. And, that they've been left to that. His more recent work is dealing with uranium, because there are 15,000 open pit uranium mines on Native American lands. And it does impact the health of the people there. So he's doing some, he has some newer, this is older, some newer work on that. And he's seeing it in his, in his, you know, his medical office. So the, la the last few things I'm going to look at, I'm a little bit more, um, is performing arts. So this summer I worked with a theater group. Um, and other, someone else in here had worked with them as well. So there's a theater group, a couple of theater groups in the city. Um, they're, they're, they're working with climate change and theater, and they bring in, they work with scientists. Scientists, in fact, they're going to be calling you Kamazima. I don't know if you have time for this, but they like to bring scientists in to a, a space to work with children or adults who are making theater pieces and to do it, teach about the problem, science, the science of it, and then do things like some of the movement you saw today, but more, be, but more specifically, they write short plays or they write long plays about climate issues, but, they're, used, but, but they're, they're educated about it because they're bringing in a, ver a variety of different types of scientists to talk about it. So there's this relationship. And one of our scientists here, who's not here, um, actually worked as a fellow with one of these theater groups. Um, so it's a really interesting, interesting experience. So here's one of the pieces that was put on this summer, an outdoor space free to the general public where they're dealing with climate issues. Out and part of the idea is that they're outside and they have to deal with whatever the weather conditions are. Um, all of the, all of the um, props are found on the street. It's right next to um, a home for uh, like one of these funded homes for elderly people. So they were out engaging. Um, and this is a really interesting piece. I, I, I'm not showing you the video, but uh, Chisa Hidaka does this work where she dances with wild dolphins. And they are trained to work with dolphins. And they have these beautiful, um, beautiful dresses on. They're out in the ocean. And they're real, they're, it's, it's an art piece really dealing with the human relationship with, with animals. And that's dance. So here I'm just going to give you some examples of uh, scientists who are public advocates and, and are speaking to the general public. So Jane Goodall, we know, right? So she's a household name. And when she speaks, people listen. It's given her a certain kind of power. I was at a huge concert this summer. And there she was. And you know, all these famous bands were up there. But when Jane Goodall's face came on the screen, she wasn't even there. She was being you know, piped in. Everybody went dead silent, thousands and thousands of people. And she spoke, and people cheered. So this is the power of someone who takes science into the public realm. Um, she can really make a difference. And, and that's, an amazing, that's an amazing thing. Um, Carl Safina, you know, again, he can make a huge difference, and he does. Right? His book, Beyond Words, is, is very powerful. And, can, and have a tremendous effect on our understanding that animals deserve respect, essentially, is what he's saying. That they have, you know, they have their own family structures. And his book, Beyond Words, I found, I was very touched because it really makes you see inside the wolf pack, you know, inside the elephant community, and see them as sentient beings who have their own relationships and care, make you care. 
Heidi Collin I just spoke of. She's an extremely powerful and she speaks all the time to children, to families, to mothers, to lay people and she speaks very effectively to lay people. Sylvia Earle, again, she's, she's, so her work wasn't in climate change, right? She's a, but, but she's now a climate change advocate and people show up in droves to hear what she has to say. She has that audience. Um, Rachel Carson I spoke of early, earlier, tremendous voice, right? That book, the impact of that book, the long lasting impact of that book. Jacques Cousteau and our very own Pat Wright. So some of you may or who knows who Catherine Hayhoe is? I know Sharon does. But so, so Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist and she brands herself as a climate evangelist. She lives in Texas, her husband's a pastor, um, she's an atmospheric scientist, and she is very media savvy. So she's, she's on TV a lot. She was on when um, Year of the Flood was opening. She was on stage with Obama. She was the scientist there. That's a pretty significant, but she sits there in her jeans and her t-shirt and her leather belt and she is everybody's next door neighbor, right? She's, and she smiles, but she's just your normal everyday young woman. And so she's accepted by everyone, right? She's, ac she's accessible. And what she says is unfortunately, the video translation didn't work. Kim worked very hard on getting it in there for me and then it didn't, it didn't move over. But so she speaks like she looks. Hey, I'm just this scientist and I'm also an evangelist. And she talks to you like she's in church. She tells you a story in this little short video that's probably a minute and a half that gets its message across. Is it on YouTube? It is on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube. Well, I could, but you know, I'll just summarize it. You all, she's got lots of, she's on PBS, she has her own show. She's also very Facebook savvy. She's on there all the time and, she, and she'll ask you a question, which is very clever. What do you think? And then everybody jumps in. Um, so she just basically tells you her story. I was in church, which is very clever because that's the audience we need to reach is the very far right Christian group that have been convinced that climate denial is the way to go. And she basically says, so a church member came over to me and said, oh, I can ask you. You know, are these facts about climate change real? And she, they, they, they assume she's going to say no. And she says, well, I hate to tell you, but they are real, and here's why. And, she's, and, she, and then she goes on to tell the audience, which is really the YouTube audience or wherever, you know, whether it's PBS, I, my husband's a pastor, I am Christian, and guess what? I'm a scientist too, and this stuff is real. And, you know, she's, she is winning people over in Texas. How much so? I don't know the stats, but... So this is one really strong approach. And what is her, if you go back to the first things I talked about, she has a specific agenda here. Her agenda is to reach a denial audience and a Christian denier audience. She's very, and she can reach other people as well, but that's the one she's really going for. And she wants to be your, her, their next door neighbor, their church member, and she speaks in very simple language. She never uses scientific language. Very simple, very short, very sweet, and smiles and wears just normal, cute, you know, the gap clothes. And she's very accessible and very successful at doing that. So that's basically my talk. And I'm concluding with this, this image, which to show you again, it's an extraordinar extraordinarily powerful image. And so that's where art and different forms of communication can be very, very effective. That's it. Thank you. from North Carolina who said he couldn't do uh, workshops on climate resiliency, but he could do them on flood protection or storm preparedness. So my question to you is, how do you see the balance between the, the benefit of avoiding the hot button words or, or images to try to reach a different audience versus the cost of toning down your, your message or not using the, the blood red lagoon, uh, you know, way of communicating, how do you balance those in communicating these issues? Well, I, I, think that you ha I think you have to do what you're comfortable doing, especially if you're starting out talking to the general public, and then you feel it out. You know, you might find it's not so difficult to talk about it over time. And I don't think there's a right way to do this. I think you have to find your own way in and your own style. Everybody's very different, and you know, you're not going to be me, I'm not going to be you. We're going to talk about things that matter to us. And the audience feels that. So, I mean, as, as 
Thomas Dima said, my primary issue has been women in the environment. And it will continue to be, because that's where my heart and concern and research has been. That's, those are the things I know most about. You know, I can, if you start asking me for statistics, I can tell you about that more than anything else. So I do believe, you know, it's like, it's like anything. You have to do the, do the thing you love first, you feel most comfortable first, and then try the other things. I mean, I'll ask you, would you, well, how would you have reacted if I had the blood red? I just found it so like, you, you're eating, I knew you were gonna be eating before we watched. And it's, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's a hard one to look at. Um, and I don't think I have to convince you either. I might, I don't know. I, it was a, pers I just made the instinctive choice not to show the blood red, but what, how many do you think I should have shown the blood red? One person, um, <laughs> Malcolm. So, you know, it, it's, it's some of it's exper experimentation, like we do in the classroom. I mean, I do a lot of undergraduate teaching. So a lot of what I know, I know from teaching undergraduates, because I feel like my undergraduates even though we're the sustainability program, I always take a poll, what do you know? And most of them know nothing. And I don't know why that is, but they don't seem to have, at least when they get to my class, they, they, or they admit, they say they don't. Okay, maybe they know a lot, but they seem, and they might know some issues, but not others. So that helps me, actually. I, I always like that, I'm like, great. Because then I can play with my, my messaging and how I say things and how they respond. So we all have to do that, right? And I'm gonna do it differently than you do it. Yeah. So isn't one thing we about who your audience is. I mean, you talk differently with five-year-olds than you talk with, so if you think you're in an audience of climate deniers, talk about things that they, like, you, like they said before, things they really care about, mm -hmm. that there's very strong evidence are gonna be affected, right. and work from there. If Absolutely. If you convince them that floods are gonna get worse and if they do X, Y, or Z, right. that's gonna help the floods. At least you made one small step. Absolutely. So that would be what I think you're right, and I think even making it as local as possible, because then it will take it out of the whole political jargon of what's happening at large, which people get caught up in. Um, no, that's right. And and you can you don't have to you know you have to be sort of flexible. I mean, you have to say it's good to say who's my. I thought some of the questions people asked today. How many of you? David's question was very clever. How many of you have know this term or know that? And that can help you. You can you can adjust. Okay, people who don't know that, so I need to explain that, or I need to say it a little bit differently. That's the beauty of a, of a talk, in the sense that you can, you can maneuver a little bit. When you start creating your social media, you do have, you can play with that too, you can see what the responses are. So I know certain issues, I, I personally, in my, um, in my work, I try to cover a broad range of topics, because I, I don't want to get locked into just animal rights, or, because it can get very, People have an attitude, like the people who think animal rights are just too out there will never come to my page or read my work. But if I kind of dance around a little bit, I, I cover, and then I know that maybe that animal rights person is gonna read about climate change. That's, that's what I strategically do that. So I might pick a person up and move them over here without them even realizing it, because they're following me, right? And yes? Go ahead. I want to be sure I hear your question fully because it's important. Um, how do you think people of color in schools that come from like diverse backgrounds outside of like, you know, like um, the demographics that are used to generally being taught about climate change and how do you think that they're represented um, not so much just in the media but like have the information that they need to know about like their community? Not well. Um, I have a I recommend you, I, hate, I'm just, I feel like I'm advocating for myself, but I made these videos. All these things I do is because I get a question like that and I can give you an easy answer. Dr. Robert Bullard is called the father of the environmental justice movement or environmental racism. I don't know if you know of him. I have a 15 minute interview with him and one of the things he says in that, it's brilliant. He's, he's just absolutely fabulous. So he, he says, okay, there's a number of problems. One, without question, all of his studies show that black communities are the hardest hit environmentally. I mean. You don't have to look very far to see it. But so he did. He started doing this work, and his first book was Dumping on Dixie. And um, but the other problem is, where does most of the money for the environmental movement go? To the big greens. The big greens are predominantly white. 
And it doesn't mean that every white person in there doesn't care about color, communities of color, but we can't help but think about our own interests or maybe miss something. So he asks, one, we need to get, and there's a lot of articles on this, we need to get more people of color into the big greens, but we also need to donate to, to, community, to, to groups and to communities of color, too, because we think, we assume Sierra Club is covering environmental justice. Maybe not enough, right? Yeah. Um, so, sorry. That's okay. Um, so, how Well, I don't want to generalize. There are communities that really do know and, and are very hard hit. And one of the problems is they don't have the power. They don't have money. They can't fight, right? I mean, and it's difficult enough for any community to fight on issues and push for policy and get elected and be in, be in a place where they can advocate for their issues. Um, so in some communities, they are very active. And there's lots of examples of that. A lot of times what you'll hear is, we are just fighting to survive, to pay the rent, to get food for their kids, to get a decent education, you know, basic, basic things. When, are we ha when do we have time to go advocate on an environmental issue? That's one of the big complaints I hear, is just we, we assume, like, it's, it's a privilege to have the time to go to the march. It's a privilege to have the time to, to do the things to advocate for environmental when you're just trying to survive. And that's why it's really important, according to Bob Bullard, that we step in and we don't let things like what's happening in Puerto Rico happen. Right. We don't let what, what happened in Michigan, right, in Flint, Michigan, happen because those communities won't have access to the power centers to make that change. So we need, we need to step up and, and be supportive. So those are really good questions. But Heidi. I would follow Robert Bullard. He's awesome on this. Heidi, thank you so much. Thank you. There are two things that you said today that pushed my buttons. <laughs> One, Only two? Yeah. Well, two that I will talk about. Okay. One is a recollection of noise. My wife's a, uh, let's say, very, very experienced fly fisher woman. She's taught fly fishing. And we used to go to one of the most beautiful rivers in America, the Natolius River in Oregon. And we went up into the mountains there. and hiked along, we probably hiked two or three hours going in, and our wilderness experience was absolutely destroyed when a helicopter came in mm. and dropped off so-called the big game hunters, you know. They fished for a couple of hours, but I'll always remember that noise mm -hmm. and how disconcerting it was, and uh, what a disappointment in a way of uh, exploring you know, destroying our experience. Yeah. The other thing that you mentioned, and maybe this, our group here being scientists will relate to it, Jacques Cousteau, that really pushed my button. First of all, he dealt a lot in misinformation. He exploited his people he was getting money from. And I really questioned <coughs> whether what he did was to the overall benefit of the environment in, in many ways. Now, again, referring to my wife, I would you'd come home and swear about Jacques Cousteau, who I knew, and she would say, Larry, he has raised more money than you will ever hope to raise. And so, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> but despite that, mm. I was quoted in the Washington Post as saying he was not playing with a full deck. Uh, but, you know, this is the kind of thing I think that the scientific community worries about is the misinformation right. that some of the great spokespeople that we have um, provide to the public. Right. How do you react to that? Well, I'll, I agree with that. I mean, I always, you know, I don't give to the big greens for that reason. I, I, I'd rather give to a group I know immediately can benefit. So I don't trust anyone, to tell you the truth. So. You know, you don't know until you go into the coffers and see where the money's going. I say it about some of our leading climate advocates. I'm like, boy, that, that person gets about $50,000 a talk, and they're flying all over the place. What are they doing with that $50,000? How many $50,000 do they need 
for that one hour? Is it going back to help? How much of it's going back? You know. So I'm, I'm with you. I, and I don't know the details of Jack Bristow. I can take him out of my talk now that I know. But um, you know, I think we all, we all want to be careful of that. We want to be supporting people doing good work, but we also want to know what, what are they doing with that? Is it really going back to the thing that you Red Cross, people, you know, all these organizations, you've got to be, people, people think that pink, the whole pink campaign is a scam. Many people argue this, you know, and it's bringing in a lot of money, right? So, yes, I agree. We got to get going over to the Wong Center. Again, Heidi, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. Thank you for asking me.